Good morning. I'm not used to being here in the summertime. <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> I usually go away from here. Um, but that's okay. I'm glad to be here this morning with you. Um, let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being with us already this morning for your word in, in song and in scripture and in study. I pray now that you will bless the words that I have, that you have for me to share, and um, go with us through this journey. In your name I pray, amen. Basic elemental instinct to survive stirs the higher passion, thrill to be alive. From the point of conception to the moment of truth, at the point of surrender to the burden of proof. From the point of ignition to the final drive, the point of the journey is not to arrive. From a point on the compass to magnetic north, the point of the needle moving back and forth, from the point of entry until the candle is burned, the point of departure is not to return. Believe it or not, I've spent more than two-thirds of my life now teaching poetry and other literature to several thousand students by now. Some are right here in this sanctuary, actually. Several graduates. I bet you didn't think you were going to have a literature lesson this morning, did you? Oh, well. <laughs> but yes, I've been teaching poetry for a long time. Some of you are probably thinking, right by now, I must be crazy. And maybe I am. But that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Others of you are probably wondering why I would do something like that to my students or myself. Well, I don't know about them, but it's been an interesting journey for me. Sometimes teaching poetry can be, well, tedious. But other times it's fun and rewarding. Sometimes the poems are easy to understand and connect with. Other times they're a little more complicated. Take the lyrics I opened with. How could the point of the journey, any journey, be not to arrive? Don't we usually go somewhere to get somewhere? Doesn't make sense on the surface, does it? When you think about it, though, the paradox begins to fade away. And the seeming contradiction becomes, instead, a comparison a metaphor fitting for this morning or any morning. Aren't we all on a journey? Aren't we all at various stages of an odyssey that will last through eternity if we do it right? No going back. The fact is that yes, we are. We are all on a journey, one that is not straightforward, one that is sometimes easy, sometimes treacherous, one that takes us through calm and chaos, sunshine and shadows, on serpentine single lane roads that wind up and down mountains and straighten out through valleys, one that provides spectacular, breathtaking vistas at times, but at others offers only endless miles of dry, desolate desert. It can be exhilarating, but also confusing and maybe even discouraging. And it's almost always unpredictable. Hearing that description, we might well hesitate to take or continue the journey. But that's where the wisdom of fellow travelers comes in and how we can make sense of this concept that the journey's the thing if we take the time to research past journeys or listen to the stories of others who have gone before us. Some of you know that my husband Tom and I are avid road trippers. If we have the time, we'd rather drive somewhere than fly. Don't get me wrong, I love flying too. It saves time, usually. It gives you a different perspective on life, literally and figuratively. But there's something about driving, something more connected, more intimate, more in tune with the landscape that you cover when you're driving. Over the past four years, Tom and I have logged tens of thousands of miles, driving through 33 states and two countries while on our home leave, holiday, and summer road trips. Last summer alone, we traveled more than 6,000 miles, cutting a big swath through much of the U.S. 
If you follow me on Facebook, you will have seen hundreds of photos of our various journeys, and you'll have read not just details about the places we've seen, but also some of the life lessons we've learned along the way. This morning, I want to share a little of what we've learned about life through our travels on the road that might be useful to you on your own journey. But first, that literary lesson I promised you, the context for the concept of life as a journey and how the journey matters as much as, if not more than, the destination. To do this, we have to go back some 2,500 years to one of the earliest of all recorded journeys in literature, Homer's The Odyssey, considered to be one of the foundation stones of the Western world's cultural heritage. And then we'll fast forward to the 19th century to Alfred Lord Tennyson's The Rest of the Journey um, poem called Ulysses, which explores Odysseus' final leg of his life's journey. Now, maybe some of you haven't read the Odyssey. I know I didn't until, oh, I don't know, a long time after most people may have done it in high school. We happened to teach it here in ninth grade, Thunderbird. I did not have it um, <clears throat> when I was my student's age, but I did finally read it. So here's in a little nutshell for those of you who may not have. Odysseus is the king of Ithaca sometime during what is known historically as the Mycenaean period, about 1400 to 900 BC. On the day his son is born, he sails with his army to fight against the city of Troy, promising his wife he will return before their son can grow a beard. Odysseus and his men fight for 10 years in what has been called the Trojan War. They finally conquer the city and they begin to sail for home. Unfortunately, Odysseus' trip ship gets separated from the others who return safely and he spends the next 10 years wandering throughout the world the seas undergoing an unbelievable series of adventures and torments caused by Poseidon god of the sea the kind of situations that myths and legends are made of meanwhile Odysseus wife Penelope has been waiting for him as promised faithful despite the numerous attempts to woo her and thus conquer Odysseus' kingdom. Upon Odysseus' return, he punishes the suitor, establishes himself as king, is reunited with his wife, son, and father, averts a potential civil war in Ithaca, and presumably settles down to live happily ever after. Well, that's Homer's Odyssey. Now we come to Alfred Lord Tennyson many years later, and he wants to know, well, what's the rest of the story? Did he live happily ever after? Well, Tennyson writes that Odysseus, after all he has gone through, 10 years of fighting the Trojan War, another 10 years making the long and adventure-filled journey back, he's not satisfied with a life of ease, and you can imagine, it might be pretty boring for him. Uh, Tennyson tells us he has grown restless in his old age and is contemplating making another, most likely, final journey. Here's what uh, Tennyson writes. And it's in um, Ulysses. He calls him Ulysses because that's the Roman, Roman name for Odysseus, the Greek name. So he calls him uh, Ulysses. But he writes in his voice, and this is what he says, I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that love me and alone. On shore and when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vex the dim sea, I am become a name for always roaming with a hungry heart. Much have I seen and known. I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use. So come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world, push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, 
much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. In his previous experiences, Odysseus has been a strong, clever, heroic adventurer. After his return, though, his life as ruler of Ithaca has been uneventful, and he longs for the old days of adventure, yearns for one more chance to find knowledge and glory before he dies. Odysseus thinks his purpose in life is to seek knowledge, and traveling the world seems to him the way to find it. Even in his old age, he cannot rest um, or resist the call to travel. He cannot be content with having arrived at his destination. For him, the point of the journey is not to arrive, and the point of departure now is not to return. In a way, this still doesn't make sense to me. Here, Odysseus has everything. He has a home, a family, a kingdom, peace. Why would he want to leave this? Why wouldn't he be happy? Why would there be no contentment for him? Odysseus has everything most people strive for, and yet there is no peace of mind for him. He is restless. There is nothing challenging him, nothing keeping him on the edge of life, nothing forcing him to live with every ounce of strength and wit he has, and he cannot live like this. He must go. He must seek and find more for his life. And suddenly, when I think about it this way, I understand. It is not that the people in his life don't matter. He has spent much of his life trying to get back to them. It is not that peace isn't important to him. He has spent much of his life fighting for it. It is not that the destination isn't necessary. He has always been going somewhere. It's that he can't stop. The point of arrival cannot, must not, be the point of determination. It must instead be the point of yet another departure. For Odysseus, there must always be another journey. There must always be another adventure. Each point of arrival must become, sooner or later, a point of departure, thus keeping the Odyssey continual and alive. And so it must be for us, too. Reading about Odysseus reminded me of what I've known ever since I started traveling, that the journey's the thing after all. Reaching the destination does us no good unless we use it as yet another point of departure, unless we use our arrival as the beginning to another journey. If we become content with merely arriving, we lose our focus, our direction, our way. Mind you, Odysseus did not rush through things. It did take him 10 years, after all, to arrive, and then another 10 to get back home. He spent time, he savored his moments, but he kept going, kept moving on toward his next destination. I'm also reminded that the journey is not always smooth sailing. Odysseus' 10 years attempt at returning to Ithaca was difficult and frightening as often as it was exciting. The gods were angry with him because he had killed a favorite son, and they made every effort to see to it that he did not survive their wrath. But Odysseus did not yield to the temptation to give in. Knocked down, literally, by wave after wave of disaster, he kept getting up, fighting back, and always, always pointed himself back in the right direction. Eventually, that perseverance won out, and he made his way home. One other thing, though, he did not do this alone. He had some help. Now, in the Greek mythology story, he had the goddess Athene, who not only gave him courage and strength, but also smoothed his way at what seemed to be the most impossible situations. And maybe this is the most important lesson to learn in Odysseus' story, that the journey cannot be completed on our own. We must rely on the gods, or in our culture, in our Christian culture, on God to see us through. Now, despite the fact that this historically-based story is laced with mythological beasts and gods and terrible things like that, finding a Christian context is easy for me. 
Indeed, I find this story strikingly similar to John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. If you've read that, you know the journey of Christian and going through the Slav Despond and all the different um, things that waylaid him on his journey. And there are other Christian allegories that depict the journey of life as well. And in fact, looking inward, I find it strikingly similar to my own life's journey. And most likely, each of you sitting here can look at your own journey and you can see all the trials and tribulations and the highs and the lows and the things that took you along and brought you back and slowed you down and sped you up. Um, our details will differ, but the human needs and experiences are essentially the same. So with that in mind, I humbly submit to you a few rules for safe journeying through this life and into eternity that I've um, noticed when I look back at my own odyssey. I encourage you as you listen to these, there are six, um, as you listen to them to interpret and apply them to your own journey. So number one, commit to a plan. A definite plan. Odysseus could never have been successful in any portion of his journeys had he not had a plan, either for battle or for travel. So it should be for us, too, if we expect to make it safely on our way. Know where you intend to go and find out what it takes to get there. Make reservations with reliable companies and agencies that will double check and confirm all plans before departure. In your spiritual journey, there are two plans to choose from. God, um, and two travel agencies to investigate. My recommendation, God's over Satan's. A much loved verse in Jeremiah, we all know it, Jeremiah 29, 11, uh, reminds us that God has a plan for us. One that will prosper and not harm us. One that will give us hope and a future. Commitment to God's plan for an eternal odyssey may not be the easiest decision but those who have traveled ahead of you can vouch for the adventure. Number two, do your homework. Yes, you heard that word, homework. Do your homework about your destination and all the points along the way. Research every aspect possible by reading guidebooks, studying maps, and talking with those who have gone before you. Find out what is acceptable behavior at these various points to make sure you do not violate any customs, insult any persons by accident, or land yourself in any embarrassing situations. Odysseus would have been home a lot sooner if he had known something about the various lands and beings he would encounter and had known how to get around their quirks and obstacles. The best guidebook available about destination heaven is, of course, the Bible. Wear it out. Christian education also offers a variety of maps, technology, and travel literature to light enlighten the eternal traveler. It offers seasoned travel guides as well for a number of stops along the way. Those of you who have already taken this leg of the journey can verify of its value in readying you for what was ahead of you. If you're in the midst of or are considering this travel plan, I urge you to do your homework. Check Google Maps to see how this route can help you find the best and fastest route to your ultimate destination. We are encouraged in Proverbs to trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. I have a little caveat here to this making plans and doing your, own home, doing your homework. Even though you've done that, you need to leave a little leeway in your itinerary for the unexpected. Because no matter how specific your GPS directions, you truly never know where the road will take you. And that's one of the things that Tom and I love about this kind of travel. There's so much to see along the way, some of it advertised, some of it serendipitously discovered while looking for something else. Don't be afraid to deviate from your plan a little bit, but make sure that your detour brings you back to your main journey. Some happy discoveries have occurred by following the unexpected opportunities. Paul in Ephesians 5 encourages us to be careful how we live, but to make the most of every opportunity. Number three, 
take precautions, get vaccinated, get the appropriate visas, don't drink the water in foreign countries, don't go anywhere alone, and don't forget to bring your documents with you every time you leave your hotel room. Odysseus and his men got into trouble early on because they did not take precautions or follow instructions. It cost them years of lonely travel, and in the end, all of Odysseus' men were lost. He was the only one left. The sad misfortune of humanity is that we tend to think we are immune from the problems of, of others, or that the guides don't know what they are talking about whenever they caution us not to do something. They're too old, outdated. They aren't relevant anymore. Life is different now. Things have changed. Don't get caught in that trap. Proverbs 12, 15 says that fools think they are doing right, but the wise listen to advice. Proverbs 19, 20 urges that we take good counsel and accept correction. That's the way to live wisely and well. And if earthly advice isn't enough, the psalmist reminds us that even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. Number four, pack light. Don't take anything with you that is not absolutely necessary. Learn to be content with less, to remember more. Take comfortable walking shoes and underwear that dries easily overnight. You might not always find laundry. Odysseus was reduced to a few sticks and a small sail in his most desperate state. But those sticks, the small sail, and a big break from Zeus, the chief god, got him safely home. In your spiritual journey, the more baggage and burdens you give up to God, the easier and quicker you can travel, and the sooner you will arrive. Peter urged us to cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and sober in mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. And last, number five, I said six, but it's five. Go with God. In the Odyssey, one of the first pieces of advice Odysseus receives during his journey home from Troy is to go along with the gods. He learns very quickly that crossing them in any way causes pain and travail and adds years to his wanderings. In many cultures, travelers are sent on their way with a kind of prayer. Go with God, they're told. Unlike Odysseus' case, this is not meant as a warning that unless you go with the gods, you'll be tossed about and perhaps lost at sea, but rather a blessing and an assurance that if you do go with God, you will reach your destination safe and sound. I love the verses that Ashley read to us this morning for the scripture. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21. Uh, and it tells us there to embrace the concept of going with God. Your life is a journey. You must travel with a deep consciousness of God. It cost God plenty to get you out of that dead-end, empty-headed life you grew up in. He paid with Christ's sacred blood, you know. He died like an unblemished, sacrificial lamb. And this was no afterthought. Even though it has only lately, at the end of the ages, become public knowledge, God always knew he was going to do this for you. It's because of this sacrificed Messiah, whom God then raised from the dead and glorified, that you trust God, that you know you have a future in God. So how do we pull this all together? How does this all relate to Tennyson's poem of the end of Odysseus' life and to the lyrics I quoted at the beginning of our journey this morning? Simply this, your earthly journey through this life and your heavenly journey into the next will only be successful if you strive to stay on course if you seek the truest of destinations, if you find a way to listen and learn from others with relevant information and experience, if you do not yield to the temptation of thinking you can do all things on your own, if you make the journey hand in hand with Jesus, and if you understand 
that the point of the journey is not to arrive, but to keep on going right on into eternity. Now, one last thing before I close. I want to speak to the significance of story and of sharing your story. I'd like to speak particularly to the older ones in the congregation. Um, and I include myself in that group. Those with substantial experience on this journey of life. I mentioned earlier the importance of listening to those who have gone before us, but one of my concerns is that those of us with more travel experience haven't shared enough about what it has meant to have Jesus as our travel guide on our life's journey. And that we haven't shared it enough, especially with those who are younger, just on the beginning of that, that journey. We share a lot of other things. We talk about our aches and pains. We talk about our jobs and our children and our families. But I don't think we share enough about the part Jesus has played in our lives. Maybe we assume that it's understood. We're here in church. We've been here for a while. We're old. We've been in this pew, these pews a long time. Maybe we think that's enough. Not sure. Maybe we think that what we've learned along the way has no bearing or relevance to others. Maybe he's so deep inside us that we think we can't find the words to express what he's done for us. I don't know, but I can tell you it matters. Sharing your stories can make all the difference to someone who is facing challenges on their journey or who just needs encouragement to persevere. Max Lucado once wrote that we need to share our story, not with everyone, but with someone. There is someone who is like you, or at least like who you were. And he or she needs to know what God can do and has done for, for you. Your honest portrayal of your past may be the courage for another's future. So risk telling your story. Risk offering to share it, even in the face of possible dismissal. You won't know the blessing unless you do it, nor will they. Now, for those of you not yet adroit at travel or who have perhaps had some bad experiences traveling, take advantage of the wisdom that surrounds you. Risk asking someone to share their story and take the time to listen and learn from their experience. Take encouragement and inspiration from them. And then for each and all of us, don't forget that above all, God is watching over us, keeping us in his plans for this life, but also for our eternal one. I encourage you today to give yourself over to those plans, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Place your destiny fearlessly and confidently in his hands. He will never fail you. As Peter wrote long ago, your life is a journey. You must travel with a deep consciousness of God. Trust him. Know you have a future in him, and that if you go with him, you will discover the point of your journey.